I've been listening to Finn McKinty, aka the Punk Rock NBA, for quite some time now, and I gotta say, he gives some pretty decent life advice. However, I do think his advice on how to quit doing drugs lacks a little bit of nuance, and so today, that's what we're gonna be talking about. Hit the intro, a. Eh? What the fuck is going on, you beautiful degenerates? It's Ashcon, aka Dropped Out Beats. Back again with another Addiction Neuroscientist Reacts video. For those just tuned into the channel, this is a part of a series where I react to anybody on YouTube talking about drugs. So if you have a video that you'd like to react to, Make some fucking noise. in the comments below, and uh, I'll, or you know, drop a comment down below of a video that you'd like me to react to, and I'll react to it. Maybe provide some science context around it. Maybe not. I say maybe not, because today we're going to be reacting to Finn McKinty, aka the Punk Rock NBA, talking about why he quit doing drugs and drinking. And so right off the bat, you already should know if you're a regular viewer of the channel, I have a problem with the title because drinking alcohol is just doing another drug. It no, doesn't make you any better than any other drug user, and so that's why I say Finn, you just quit doing drugs. You didn't quit drinking and doing drugs. You just quit doing drugs. But with that being said, we're going to primarily focus on how uh, the language that Finn uses around surrounding addiction and how it's not necessarily productive, but his advice on how you can quit is actually pretty productive and actionable for that matter. So with that being said, I'm going to take my big ugly head off the screen and we're gonna put Finn's beautiful face on the screen let's get to it it's minor threat video seems appropriate okay time for another edition of uh self-help with Papa Finn and today I want to it's self-help with Papa Finn and your degenerate friend dropped out beats today to talk to you guys about uh something I guess a little bit more serious than I usually talk about, which is why I stopped doing drugs and drinking. You may have heard me talk about this before and I'll keep it short, but to make a long story short, I come from a family full of addicts. Uh, my mom was an alcoholic because like I talked about in some of my other videos, she had a horrible childhood. You know, her parents died and then her brother killed himself and she got raped and all this awful stuff. So because of that, you know, she became an alcoholic later in life, which is totally understandable. I completely get it. I'm not judging her for it, but it made her pretty difficult to be around. And so this is something that I really like about Finn when he kind of talks about his relationship with his mom is that he has an appropriate amount of empathy for the trauma that she went through that made her into the person that she became in his mom, right? And so I think that's something everybody can learn from Finn is that you don't have to um, you don't have to tolerate everything the person does just because they have been through this trauma, but it helps you to empathize with them it helps you to better love them when you understand that this is all a trauma response is basically what i'm getting at and so i like how finn talks about that if there's one thing you can definitely learn from finn and how to think and talk about something it is that however he use he does not use person first language and so uh let me uh make myself big here for just a second again and so this is kind of the or rather i didn't need to make myself big this is kind of the focus of today's um video is that words matter terms to use and avoid when talking about addiction and so um i'm not going to go through this article i'll link it down below finn i hope you read it and watch this video but um basically this is centered around stigmatizing addiction and how stigmatizing people who have a substance use disorder doesn't actually help them get better in the long run and so i recommend going through this article you can kind of skim it get the idea of what they're talking about basically you'll hear finn throughout this video refer to people as addicts junkies alcoholics um uh abuse right he'll say drug abuse habit go through this you'll you'll definitely learn some things and you'll 
frequently hear me use person first language on this channel and so this is where my critique is going to to center around finn is his stigmatization of drug use and his language his stigma stigmatizing language and caused a lot of problems i mean she was married four times i have two stepdads but one of them and two of his brothers went to prison for selling heroin. My other uncle on the other side went to prison for selling drugs in the 90s. My other stepdad, the person who called my dad, never did time or anything like that, but he was like a junkie and stuff in the 70s and 80s and like. See, he said that his stepdad was a junkie. And so you don't really wanna say junkie because that implies, you know, that person is a piece of trash. We don't need to respect that person, no. Just because that person has a substance use disorder, usually we're referring to people struggling with opioid use disorder as junkies. And so I'm going to assume that's what he's saying is that, you know, maybe this person was on heroin. Um, you don't want to just call them a junkie and discard them as a piece of trash. They're a real human being. You want to treat them with respect. You want to love them as a human being. And, you know this idea that they're a junkie the words do matter because when you call somebody a junkie it Im it implies that they are a piece of trash you don't have to respect them ex you know keep going down the line and so that's gonna that's gonna be something i'm gonna try to get across more on this channel is that the words matter we need to to treat everyone with respect regardless of the drugs they use or if they have a substance use disorder and so yeah finn junkie's not a good word like i don't know it's kind of kind of heavy stuff for me to like deal with like is I, I went to this hippie store with my dad when i was in like seventh grade or something and at this time he was a corrections officer he got clean and all that stuff but you know he he was bad enough that he was like shooting speed balls in his neck and stuff but he was clean by this time and we went into this hippie store he's kind of looking around and they're like oh uh can i help you sir because they called him sir because he looked like a normie then and he was like oh no no i'm good i just my brothers and I, this used to be like an abandoned building, and my brothers and I used to go uh, shoot up upstairs here when I was in college. I just, uh, just was curious what what this place looked like now. And they're like, uh, oh, okay, okay, well, let us know if you need anything. And so I grew up around all this stuff, just like basically surrounded by addicts um, my whole life. One of my earliest memories also was like, I was like maybe four or five or something. I remember us having to like go to the hospital and her best friend was in the hospital because I think her liver was failing or something like that. And she like died of liver failure that night. And I just remember my mom crying about it. My stepsister died of an OD when we were 20. She's like basically the same age as me. She got hooked on- I'm sorry for your loss, Finn. On uh, Oxy somehow or another. Well, I know why, because her dad was an abusive piece of shit. And so she got hooked on Oxy's and uh, Oxy's are really hard on your liver. So the point I want to make here is that I grew up just surrounded Alcohol is also very hard on your liver, and so that's why on this channel we don't believe that there is such thing as anything as hard drugs, because you can't actually define the word hard in hard drugs. What does that mean? It's hard on your buddy, body? All drugs are hard on your body, um, you know, for the most part, and it doesn't mean that, that's, that the drug is hard to quit. Most drugs are are hard to quit if you have a substance use disorder it implies that it is hard to quit right there's all drugs you know for the most part have a have a component substance use disorder you know cannabis use disorder alcohol use disorder amphetamine use disorder cocaine use disorder heroin use disorder so yeah something to think about by you know drug addicts and alcoholics my entire life as a child and drug addicts and alcoholics should be people who struggled with a substance use disorder all of that stuff seemed pretty normal to me um but unlike a lot of people who grew up around that stuff i never got into it like when i was in high school i was straight edge i never even wanted to like experiment i think like i took one sip of beer when i was like five years old or something and I was like, ew, this is disgusting. Beer is the worst thing in the world. Who would ever want to drink this? And I, I, I never, I was just never interested in any of that stuff. I got Funny enough, I always thought beer smelled absolutely amazing. Like my parents didn't really drink. Like my dad comes from Iran. So like alcohol is illegal there. So like he never really drank. My mom 
my grandpa had an alcohol problem, so she never really drank. So like I would go to my friend's house and I remember smelling beer and being like, damn, that stuff smells so good. But I didn't drink until I was 15. And then when I did drink beer, I was like, the fuck? I got drunk on my 21st birthday. I stopped being straight edge and I went to this bar with a friend of mine on my 21st birthday and I got not even drunk. I had like two or three beers or something. I got like tipsy and I was like, oh, this is pretty fun. But throughout my 20s, I still barely drank like a little bit. But, you know, probably I got drunk less than 10 times in my 20s. Um, until I was like 28 or something like that. And then I got dumped by this girl that I was with at the time, and it was really hard on me. I took it really badly. Not her fault at all. I was like... 100% on me, just to be clear. But I just sort of like, uh, I don't know, just kind of lost it and uh, went off the deep end. And I started uh, a lot of the people that I knew at the time were like partying a lot. And even though I swore that I would never be like my mom, you know, having this string of failed relationships and, you know, just partying, you know, I mean, by the time she was 30, she had me when she was 33, I think. And she'd been married three times, I think then and i was like oh, i'm never gonna do that i'm never gonna have this string of failed relationships i'm never gonna you know drink and lo and behold i did and i spent another like you know maybe three or four years or so just going like going real hard i was drinking a lot and i was mostly into like adderall and cocaine uh i liked uppers i don't know like the worst i, I did like 300 milligrams of adderall in a that's a lot of adderall my friend Whew day once that's like the most i ever did i stayed up for like four days without sleep and started seeing shadow people and like thought that there were like people in the army trying to like chase me down and kill me and i was like oh shit this is not good i am going a little bit too hard on this and so i had a few other so i don't know if that um i would have to hear finn talk about this more i don't know if that would be considered a full-blown amphetamine induced psychosis episode but if you are interested in the neurobiology of an amphetamine-induced psychosis episode, please, you know, click, where am I? Click, 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 click up here. And uh, you can go watch my Fergie video where I break down the neuroscience behind um, an amphetamine-induced psychosis episode. And so the reason I say I don't know if this is a, an amphetamine-induced psychosis episode is because an extreme lack of sleep like Finn is talking about can lead to seeing those like shadow people and um, having those types of uh, sleep sleep related hallucinations where you're so sleep deprived that you start hallucinating people with extreme insomnia um, can experience that and so the army people stuff definitely sounds like some um, amphetamine induced psychosis episode um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in that, go check out my Fergie video. Back to the reaction. Experiences like that where I kind of decided that it was time to pump the brakes. And I'm glad I did because, you know, this was like the first time I did cocaine was like 2008 or 9 or something like that. And the last time I did it was probably like 2012, I think. And these days that stuff is all laced with fentanyl and it could kill you. Yeah, shadow people is a good indicator that you went hard. Yeah, cocaine being laced with fentanyl really... It's ridiculous that every single drug is laced with fentanyl, and so that's why we should probably provide people a safe supply in some way, shape, or form, even though I bet Finn would disagree with me. Yes, it is. Yeah, I was going pretty hard, harder than most people, but I was able to quit very easily. Like, I literally quit overnight, never, like, had any interest or desire to go back. And I will tell you how. And I'm not saying that this is going to work for everybody because it probably won't. One thing to understand is that I would not call myself an addict. I just did a lot of drugs and drank a lot because I was unhappy and I wanted to do something to take my mind off of my unhappy life. And so this is this is my problem with Finn's kind of lack of self-awareness here is that is everyone with a substance use disorder and so to say that you're not an addict but other people are addicts like you've you've called people junkies alcoholics drug addicts i'm just confused as to how finn doesn't see himself as one of those people because, again, we talked about how everyone should learn from Finn's 
empathy towards his mom and saying like i understand that she was traumatized and that's why she dealt with this um or that's why she had a propensity towards a substance use disorder but at the same time finn doesn't seem to be understanding of himself that the trauma he went through in his early life set him up to experience a substance use disorder again and so the cycle played itself out and so finn i don't know what an addict is and isn't to you and that's what is confusing um and so that's where i just don't like you using some of the words you use in proceeding to stigmatize other people because you don't stigmatize yourself but you talk about other people in this way and so as we get on with the video i think you'll kind of see that so let's get on with it so for me i was able to quit like literally overnight and i'll tell you why at the worst of it was when i lived in columbus i lived in ohio and i hated my job i worked for abercrombie and fitch at the time as a designer i did design and i did marketing and it was an absolutely awful toxic place to work i hated my job everyone there was just a complete fucking asshole i was in a really dysfunctional bad relationship with somebody who you know, she had a lot of problems. God bless her. I have nothing bad to say about her, but it was a really dysfunctional, fucked up relationship. And so I had this horrible job that I hated. I had this awful relationship that like made me want to die. So because of that, I basically just would use as many drugs as I could to just like take my mind off of it. How old was I at this time? I like 30 one to 33, which is way too old to be acting like this. But I realized so it one thing I will say that Finn is kind of right when he says like I was way too old to be acting like this is go go check the DMX video um, to see that the younger you use drugs, the more likely you are to develop a substance use disorder and struggle with being able to stop using that drug. Um, but I did let me make myself big here for just a second because. I think it's slightly irresponsible of Finn to just say like, oh, I quit overnight. That may be true for you, Finn, but you need to provide a little bit of context for other people if you are trying to help other people. Some people are on drugs that if they quit overnight, the withdrawal will literally kill them. Okay, so don't just t don't advise everyone to quit overnight. So if you have a serious alcohol problem, you cannot quit drinking overnight. You need to most likely check yourself into a rehab. They will help you wean off of alcohol. The same is true for a benzo benzodiazepine addiction. You cannot quit these drugs cold turkey if you have a serious substance use disorder and physical dependency to these drugs. You could possibly die from withdrawal. So that's where checking yourself into a rehab, going to a hospital, and getting some uh, pharmacological help from a rehab can help you wean yourself off the drug safely and then quit the drug, right? So maybe for something like amphetamine, cocaine, um, opioids to some extent, you can quit cold turkey, but... Just something to think about. Depending on what drug you are struggling with, you may or may not be able to quit cold turkey. If it's benzodiazepines, I don't necessarily recommend it. Back to the video. I don't really have like a drug problem. I have a life problem. So I took myself out of this situation. I left that job. I left. Let's, let's just rewind for two seconds because this is honestly everybody who has a substance use disorder. I don't really have like, which is way too old to be acting like this, but I realized I don't really have like a drug problem. I have a life problem. So I took myself out of this situation. I left that job. I left Ohio. I left that relationship and I drove across the country here, moved back here to Seattle where I'm from. And literally the day that I left Ohio, I lost all desire to do any of that stuff that I just ever since. I mean, I'll, I've had a couple drinks here and there, but I'm just like, I don't want to drink. Like I would drink if I wanted to, 
I just don't want to. There's a couple lessons here that um, I want to kind of take away here. And again, I'm not saying that what worked for me will work for you by any means, but I'm just going to share a couple lessons for me because they might help someone else. Number one is that when you're doing drugs, when you're drinking, when you're living that lifestyle, it's only a matter of time until something bad happens to you. Basically, if you play with fire long enough, you're going to get burned, whether that means getting pulled over by the cops and you've got something in your car that you shouldn't have. I want us to kind of think about all the things he's about to list and really the problem. What is the real problem of these of these things he's about to list? Have like a fucking eight ball of cocaine or you're going to get robbed or, you know, like buying drugs is like statistically one of the most dangerous things you could do. Buying or selling drugs. You know, I'm buying fucking a baggie full of Adderall from some sketchy ass dude that I've never met before that definitely has a gun. You know, you could get robbed. You could get caught in the crossfire or something. It's only about like, I mean, this is how my uncles ended up in prison. You know, they got caught. They bought a bunch of heroin and drove it from California up to Washington and they got caught along the way and they ended up in prison because of it. They're felons, you know? So number one, if you have managed to get away with this lifestyle so far, quit while you can, because it is only a matter of time until fucked up shit happens. You know, you get someone pregnant, you get herpes, you get arrested. Like it's only a matter of time. It is going to happen. So pump the brakes while you still can. And trust me, without exception, bad shit will happen to you if you're living this way. Okay. So if you've gotten away with it so far, you know, cross your lucky stars and decide that today is going to be the day that you stop or that you start making a change. Number two is to understand that for most people, you know, you're not born with the desired. Okay, so I need to, I need to kind of comment on that number one. Basically all of the things that he listed was just a side effect of drugs being illegal in our society. So if you get pulled over with an eight ball of cocaine and the police search your car and find an eight ball of cocaine provided that you just weren't, you know, super geeked up and, you know, obviously didn't need to be driving your car at 120 miles per hour. You know what I'm saying? You know, provided you weren't doing that, provided you hadn't snorted any of the powdered substance yet, and we're just driving your car safely home with the eight ball in the car. Um, this in itself, to me, is not a crime. I don't think drug use is a moral... Uh, issue in this country and it shouldn't be and that's why we shouldn't have non-violent drug users being put in prisons and jails because uh, just having an eight ball of cocaine me as a normal citizen I don't I don't care you know um, and so while that's going to be a problem for someone with a substance use disorder we could mitigate that problem by just not having that be a law um, I can't remember all of the, the things exactly that he says, but it's along those lists of lines of like, you know, you're going to get in trouble with the law because you're doing drugs and drugs are illegal. Okay, well, then that means that we need to somehow provide a safe supply. I think he said something about, you know, you could get in trouble or basically, you know, buying drugs from a drug dealer is dangerous. Drug dealers are very sketchy. Okay, so, but when I go get you know, Percocet from the pharmacist or I go get Adderall from the pharmacist, there's nothing sketchy about that transaction. I get the drugs. I know that it's 100% Percocet for my broken leg. I know that I'm taking my Adderall for my ADHD, whatever it is. I'm just providing, you know, examples of a legal drug use transaction that's perfectly acceptable that could be the case for any, any drug use, even if it's recreational. Um, and so... Yeah, that's something to think about, that these problems that he lists that uh, are at the top of his problem list is just a function of drugs being illegal in the society. Now, whether or not you get a disease like AIDS from using um, a non-clean needle, a dirty needle, that's a serious problem that a substance use disorder could lead to. But again, changing some of the laws in this country would most likely help that because then people could go get clean needles. Um but again, he is right in the sense that there are, for example, a lot of people, this was one thing that I, I was glad I learned in grad school. A lot of people think that having a DUI is normal. 
having a DUI is only normal amongst those people who struggle with a substance use disorder of alcohol, for example, right? Like most people don't have DUIs. Only most people who struggle with an alcohol use disorder have DUIs. So something to think about. Now let's now let's listen to his second his second point. His second point is that you're not born with a desire to do drugs, which I disagree with, but let's get there to do drugs. Like it's not like some alien inside you that's like forcing you to do this. It's a response to something else, you know, typically some kind of like trauma, whether it's, you know, childhood abuse or mental health or something like that. So, so I think his point more so is that you're not born with a substance use disorder. Okay. This is true. But most people are born with a desire to alter their consciousness, whether this be through jujitsu. Both Finn and I like to train jujitsu. Finn, let's roll sometime, bro. Would love to. Um, but y- drugs are a part of that, right? Like we all like to change our consciousness, and people don't like to think of activities that they do sober as consciousness changing, but they are. Um, whether it be, like I said, jujitsu. Uh, swimming, sports, um, music, like all of these things change your brain and your conscious state. So you're born with the desire to mess with your conscious state. That is a fact. Um, But no, you are not born with a substance use disorder. And so I like what he's saying here about how you don't have to have one, right? Oh, you need to understand what is making you act this way. And I would suggest I've never gone to like, I, well, I went to AA with my mom. So my mom got sober when I was like a little kid and I went to a lot of AA meetings with her and stuff. So I never went to AA meetings. You can also tell that Finn has that underlying um, AA knowledge in his back pocket when he talks about these things because it is very, very AA in a oriented. Go check um, my Julie... One of my videos has to deal with Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't remember which one because I've made a bunch. Go check them out. Meetings for myself because I don't really ever think I was an alcoholic, but I, I did go with her and AA saves uh, a lot of lives. They will help you break through. The hardest part of this is admitting to yourself that you have a problem. But once you have done that, you need to understand why you act this way. And then you need to take yourself out of those circumstances. So for me, I had to move because all the people that I knew in Ohio, pretty much, not all of them, but the vast majority of the people that I knew in Ohio were like fuck ups and addicts. And I knew that if I was hanging out with them, like if you think you can hang out with a bunch of like addicts and you can be sober around them, that's fiction. It's not gonna happen. If everyone else is drinking, if the other like 10 people around you are drinking, you're gonna do it eventually too. It's gonna happen. You are not gonna, be able to resist that lifestyle long enough, okay? So you need to make a clean break from all of those people. And that's what I did. So I realized that I didn't really have like a drug problem, I had a life problem. And so I had to fix my life. When it comes to like getting clean and getting sober, you need to look at it holistically. It's not just like, oh, if I stop drinking, everything in my life will be okay. That's not the way it works. You probably need to work on your entire life, which is scary. It's tough. It's not easy. It's hard fucking work. It's brutally hard and it's probably not going to happen overnight. But what's the alternative? The alternative is literally you will die. That is the alternative. You need to understand that. Finn, we're all going to die anyway, bro. But I think that's a good place to stop. He, He does give some, that is some good advice that, you know, I think that's why rehab works for so many people, right? Is because you can take yourself out of that environment. You can go somewhere that you've never been. You have no ties to. You don't know anybody. You don't... There's nothing, right? It's a new start. And so it's an anus tart if you're uh, an Arrested Development fan. Anyway, uh, yeah. So I think that's some pretty good advice. You know, if you are in a friend group where everyone is struggling with a use disorder... You don't have to think of them as bad people who are fuck-ups and drug addicts that you can never talk to again. But, you know, removing yourself from that environment and that friend group may be useful for you to help get sober. And so I do agree with Finn in that regard. 
it just doesn't have to be this moral consternation that, you know, everyone who uses drugs is a bad person. And that's really my problem with straight edge people. Straight edge people moralize drug use and they say that everyone who uses the drugs that I don't use are bad people, but all straight edge people do in fact use drugs. They like to drink caffeine. And caffeine, like alcohol, is just another drug. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I don't like to moralize drug use. But if this is your first time tuning into the channel, I appreciate having you here. Please hit the subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. Hit the like. Please comment a video down below that you would like me to react to. Yeah, I appreciate all you beautiful degenerates. That being said, peace out. Drop out, drop out, drop out.